Here you go, Aina. Thank you, Shirley. Good afternoon and welcome to our 2021 training series of webinars. I'm Aina O'Canela and I manage the National Building Control Office training. We work with building control authorities, owners, designers, builders and suppliers of construction products to promote compliance with the building regulations. Product suppliers have a vested interest also in ensuring that their products are used correctly in the construction process and not damaged in the process and where we find damaged or misused products during our site visits, we are now informing suppliers and manufacturers of these products, who in turn are encouraged to promote compliance through education and training in the correct use of these products in buildings. The mission of the National Building Control Office or NBCO is to promote a culture of compliance with the building regulations in an industry marked by rapid changes in technology and processes. We do this through five pillars, compliance support, education and training, what we're doing today, inspections, our BCMS system on localgov.ie and market surveillance of construction products. The building control legislation framework within which we work includes the Building Control Acts 1990 to 2014, the Building Control Regulations, the Building Regulations Part A to M, the European Union Construction Products Regulations and Associated Market Surveillance, and the European Union Energy Performance in Building Regulations. To promote compliance with the building regulations, we support building control officers in the 31 local authorities who are continually inspecting for compliance with the building regulations and building control regulations. Inquiries can be made to the relevant building control authority or ourselves at support at mbco.gov.ie or to the department at building standards at housing.gov.ie. I would ask that you use the question and answer function throughout the webinar. The Q&A will be provided under the video description or comment section of the video and our YouTube channel, MBCO DCC. We may answer some questions time permitting as well at the end of Hugh's presentation. I will now hand you over to Hugh from Partel, who will speak on methods and applications to improve air and wind tightness. I'll stop my screen share now so you can start yours, Hugh. I can see your screen perfect, Hugh. Great. Um, okay, so um, thanks firstly for, for having me on. Um, it's great to see the changes and the, I suppose the engagement from building control and look, everyone's kind of after the same thing. So hopefully all moving towards better compliance and ultimately better quality building for the final occupants. Um, so my name is Hugh Wierski, I'm the director at Partel, I'm an engineer, um, I come from a professional practice, so hopefully fairly in tune with what you guys are, are looking for. Um, we're an Irish company with a global presence, we operate in North America, UK, mainland Europe, um, and typically we're, we're driven by architects and engineers. Um, we're generally ourselves most interested or focused in building physics. Um, and for sure, we, we manufacture and distribute high performance solutions for the for, for the markets we're involved in. We do a lot of R&D and um, that also allows us to do quick um, Q&A on maybe 
alternative solutions. If there's something different that somebody is looking at, we can actually um, test the performance of that product in combination with ours pretty quickly. And the idea with the presentation today is to update you as we see it from the regulations point of view, to give you the building physics knowledge to maybe allow a more focused um, analysis of maybe some of the things that could be problems on sites, um, both in terms of regs and, and kind of what it means physically. So first we look at the NZEB standards and what the changes are. So um, I suppose what it's come from is the EPBD. So the um, essentially that the nearly zero energy building has a very high energy performance index. Um, essentially that the low amount of energy needed should be covered to a significant extent from renewable sources. Um, and the big changes are really in towards in, in deep and the BER. Um, so for part L that's can be an A2, could be an A3 house, but really it's the maximum energy performance coefficient of 0.3. That's 30% of the 2005 reference house and the carbon performance coefficient of 0.35. And that's 35% of the 2005 standard. When it gets into part F and part L, we're now in a situation where an air permeability um, of below three means that mechanical ventilation should be used. Um, when that's um, between three and five, there's a possibility for natural ventilation to be used. Um, on, in practice and construction sites, that natural ventilation is, in my experience, hard to achieve, um, to be actually compliant. So we actually had a retrofit project um, about three weeks ago where three recently completed and supposedly compliant with natural ventilation projects and um, supposedly they had their the correct certification but essentially there was a an opening grill um supplying a certain amount of fresh air um it had a size and a dimension on the inside but the pipe was smaller the bricks on the outside were smaller so it was it was reduced quite a bit from what it should be so actually not compliant when you look a little bit deeper um, part L, we have the 20% renewable energy contribution based on energy demand um, and the U value changes. So why do we build airtight? I guess firstly, the, the approach towards airtightness is absolutely relevant for residential and commercial. Um, and our systems, you know, always work as an internal and external. So a full system um, is kind of what we're looking for. And that helps to control the vapor or the vapor control strategy for the overall building. Um, so the main reason that we build airtight, everyone kind of appreciates and gets that that's to lower energy costs. Um, it's also to improve comfort levels. So um, the better built the house, the lower the average temperature can be. So if we're in a house that there's a lot of drafts, um, you will feel the urge to increase the heat in that house to compensate for that. Whereas if we've got the correct detailing, so thermal bridge free, uh, continuous air tightness and good quality insulation, the heating demand will be less based on comfort as well. We also want to improve indoor air quality and the uh, air tightness is absolutely integral to that. Um, but point four as an engineer and I guess from a building control point of view, structure integrity is key. Um, so it's not an air tightness layer, it's an air and vapor control layer. So it's an AVCL, a critically important part of any building. Um, we know it's gauged on air tightness, but really it's there to control the moisture in the building. So we need to know kind of how that um, how that works and what the impact is if we don't have things right. So overall kind of job of these products is to really to stop um, and control the moisture in the building. So here we're looking at a, let's say a timber frame construction and this, um, I suppose the exaggerated example, there is no air and vapor control there. Um, and kind of what can happen is the warm, humid air inside the house, which it might only be 
at 60%. If that's allowed to pass into the construction, it can reach what is the dew point in the construction. That allows the air to, air to cool um, and it loses the ability to hold moisture. And that's kind of what drives the structural issues in buildings. So um, while this is exaggerated, we can have a significant amount of vapor through small air leaks. So uh, one meter cut can allow the equivalent of about three to 500 milliliters of water per day. So it's really significant. And it's kind of why we should be aware from a building control point of view, um, the importance of the air tightness. And it does go a little bit past what is your, your air tightness result. So is it an effective moisture control, control strategy, um, even if the air tightness is below five? Um, certain parts of the building have more risk than others, so flat roof construction, kind of as they always have, um, are more finely balanced, so we can have issues with them much easier, so maybe air tightness of three in a flat roof isn't enough to maintain the, the suitability of or the safety of the flat roof long term, and I'll get into that in more detail soon. Just a quick slide on breathability and kind of what it is. Um, breathability in construction refers to water vapor, not to air. So it's important to distinguish the two. A building can be airtight and breathable. It can be airtight and not breathable. Essentially, that the, the building fabric, if it's breathable, doesn't uh, compensate for fresh air. So a lot of the products you'll see from our market will be uh, distinguished by their ST value. So the ST value is the equivalent air layer thickness. Vapor barriers and vapor checks um, are, I suppose, what we'd call quite closed. So they can be a vapor check, vapor barrier, vapor tight, and the products on the outside typically are vapor open. That's our roof membrane. So the idea with that is that we end up with a good layering approach. So we're more vapor open on the outside, more vapor tight on the inside. Again, on the flat roofs, it doesn't always work like that. Um, we're often vapor tight on the outside um, and we need to have a different strategy to manage the moisture if that's the case. It's the same for older buildings, solid wall construction. We need to have a different approach. In terms of products and systems, um, I guess it, we um, have produced and have tested a Passive House um, certified system. So the system is the tapes, the membranes, the glues, all as a combination and we're essentially zero air leakage in that but it is good for you to know that the membranes themselves are covered by a harmonized um, CE standard so DOP is enough with an airtight membrane but it doesn't cover the tapes and the adhesives um, which is you know totally integral to the functioning of the system so an overall system test is important. Um, you'll see a good bit in the industry about active moisture management that could be called intelligent membranes or variable membranes. And I want to give you an idea of how they work. Um, the main thing with moisture variable membranes is that they have a dual function. So they can protect the structure in the winter. Essentially, the, the membrane becomes less breathable. In the summertime, it can facilitate extra drying. So these products are important in, in most buildings because we actually need them. So I mentioned earlier, if we don't have a vapor open membrane on the outside, for whatever reason, it could be a concrete structure, a solid wall, we then need to have a variable or an active membrane on the inside. Um, there is more technically from a building control point of view that we'll get into, but the general principle with these products is that they uh, facilitate additional drying. So here in the summer, you can see the pores of the membrane are quite open, allowing that extra drying. And in winter, they're now closed. This next slide gives you an idea of what that can mean over a period of time in relation to overall water content in construction. So this is a, a high altitude project, so pretty extreme. 
Um, but really we're looking at the difference a variable membrane can make. So we've got OSB, standard variable, fixed perm, or a more standard PE. And kind of essentially what we had in these is either increasing values of moisture over time, or in the case of the VARA plus, the variable membrane, a decrease. The overall variable system comes with tapes, membranes, um, and even a fluid applied product. So they're all kind of working in the same way. And if that's the system that's specified, um, yeah, it is important that, the, the, that all parts get applied together. On the fluid applied, it's a, it's a newer type of technology. So good to see how it actually works. Um, Essentially, it's two parts. It's a brush applied and a roller applied. Roller or spray, I should say. So their products are um, very good water resistance. They can actually act as a, as a radon barrier and are certified for that. But the membrane is applied with an airless um, paint sprayer in two layers. And you'll see the brush applied product being used on junctions and joints. The brush applied products tend to have a fiber reinforcement that can allow for some movement in joints, but also to um, close larger gaps. So onto condensation risk assessments, um, maybe the most relevant part for building control. Um, it's something we do a lot of, and I wanna give you um, some information on the differences um, I suppose in the ways we can do that. So there is a part, section in Partel where it's called up that um, full checks should be performed on the likelihood of surface and interstitial condensation in accordance with EN ISO 13788 2012. Um, there's another point below it where there is another and an alternative way to do that. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the two of those and why we need to uh, be more aware of that and what the impacts of that are. So on the left on these, we have the 13788. That's known as the Glazer method or steady state dew point assessment. We also will look at the 15026, which is the hydro thermal numerical simulation using MUFI. There's really huge differences between these. Um, so if we look at the standard Glazer method, Essentially what that does, it's a snapshot through the building, but it doesn't allow for um, rain. It doesn't allow for the ability for different materials to transfer moisture between them. Um, it doesn't allow for the actual location, capillary action, quite um, limited in how it can assess a project. Whereas Woofy um, can simulate over a period of time and take account of all of those different factors. Um, the exterior surface, kind of how, how it um, is genuinely assessed and kind of what we need to do in that is be careful about where we use each one. The laser method can be used for a very simple kind of um, construction analysis, whereas something like Woofy um, is absolutely needed and it's actually covered in the regs. Um, in the EN standards, it's telling us which one can be used where. Um, so Woofy, you can use everywhere. And uh, the laser, you shouldn't use on any flat roof. It shouldn't be used on any solid wall or any complex construction. And generally, the software like Woofy is a far more thorough way of assessing it. So uh, just a, a quote from Joseph Little and a, a comment on this. Um, the laser method has been around for about 50 years, but it's widely used and trusted. But from my point of view, it's not a safe method to use in volume. Um, it's likely that most suppliers are aware of the actual difference differences, but the laser method is very quick. Um, it gives you a yes, no answer, um, whereas Woofy requires more time um, and more in-depth analysis. I'm going to show you how that Woofy program and software works. Um, this is a, this was an example of a typical timber frame construction where we have a brick on the outside, a layer of OSB, 
on inside and outside of the stud um, and a, a mineral or fiber insulation in the middle. So when we build our model in Woofy, it looks a little bit like this. We can simulate the amount of air changes in the cavity, but we can also include the level of air tightness that we expect to get. And that is represented as a moisture source in construction. When we go a little deeper into Woofy, we can get lots of different types of output, but here we're looking at the moisture content in the outer layer of OSB. So in this section here, we can see that it will dry every summer. Um, every winter, the moisture will increase. Um, in this case, it's in equi equilibrium. So it's not drying out. It's doing the same thing every year. And it's got a, an average moisture content in winter of about 16.5%. So the risk area for timber is, you know, they're about from 17, 16, 17 percent and up. So it means if that construction um, was applied like that and constructed absolutely perfectly, probably it would work, but it's borderline. So for us, when we look at that, we try to see how can we improve it. Um, this shows you the moisture content of the wood fiber, which is um, absolutely fine. It's about ten, average 10% and the OSB on the inside average 8%. If we go back to the outside and we change that outside board from OSB to something like Medite or a more vapor open product, its maximum moisture content is now below 12.6%, an average of about 12. So it actually gives us a buffer or a safety zone. Um, but overall, that's kind of how we deal with airtight or with the condensation risk assessment. So it'll give you a much bigger picture, but the person that's carrying out the work needs to have the, I suppose, the requisite training or knowledge to, to be able to advise correctly. So how do we build airtight on site? It's really a three part process. It's from the designer, it's the QA on site and it's the testing. We like to see the testing as a two part process. Testing should ideally be carried out when all of the vapor control layers are still visible so that we have time to track where the air leakage is and make improvements. On the air tightness, if the building is complex, um, it is worth asking people, what is the airtight strategy? How are you dealing with that? And the red line principle is a really nice way to look at that. Um, we decide what each layer or where the airtightness layer is going to be, and we come up with the detail for each junction. So from Partel, we're doing a lot of work with the actual construction drawings, and we've got um, validated details for pretty much every application. Um, the one you're looking at here is a kind of a complex flat roof construction, one that we would have needed to assess in Woofy. Um, but they're all there, you know, people just need to ask for the details and they're very robust and solid details. It includes everything down to penetrations, you know, retrofit, floor joist insulation, quite substantial. We then have the QA on site, and this is kind of what's really important. So um, in a good application, you'll see lots of this type of thing. So nice, taut, stretched membranes, um, not too much. But if they look like that, the likelihood is, is the applicator has a good knowledge of what he's doing. We have got um, videos um, online, so quite a, quite a bit. Um, I so suppose have good quality applications. So the idea here was to um, really was to produce good content that people on site can quickly see how to how to apply the products. I'm not going to play the whole video, but just to show you um, a little bit of kind of what's available. There's no sound, Hugh. Perhaps there might or shouldn't be. Sorry? There's no sound from the video. Maybe that's oh, the way it? it's supposed to be. Uh, okay, sorry. It is on mine for some reason. But um, yeah, there, there definitely is um, sound and application tips during the installation. But um, it's all there, and we just need people to take the time to look at it. So this is a 
a new series of videos and we pretty much have them for all products. And it's got nice clear guidance on how we should do everything. So um, the links will be included with the presentation, um, but they're on our YouTube channel. So all the little things we need to look at um, is the tape correctly overlapped and it's all targeted towards a good quality application. So I wanted to show you the, a few photos from a site inspection that I had about two years ago. So in this case, it was a, it was a timber frame construction. Um, so the developer had gotten delivered quite a good quality kit from a timber frame company. So all external walls were uh, complete, if you like, with air tightness membranes. And their job after that was to deal with all the connections um, to install the roof membranes, uh, the vapor controllers at ceiling level, but also to manage the trades on site. So I suppose it's the perfect example of what not to do. So the contractor got the cheapest PE product they could find. Um, it's not connected or joined at all. Uh, construction trades were allowed to penetrate it as much as they want. Um, and here you have actually the the membrane supplied by the timber frame company. You can see the ceiling membrane here. And this spray foam is actually how they tried to join it after they failed the blower door test. You'll see more from the same site here. So, you know, lots of spray foam being used retrospectively, even at this in a really poor way. So if you're looking to get good air tightness details, you need to expose the pipes, have them far enough away that we can actually um, apply something like a, a good quality grommet. Um, they're all sized to the exact pipe that's being used. Or we have solutions that can be used or shaped to pretty much any surface, these butyl type products. Um, what most projects on site need is a, is a workshop at an early stage, and that needs to incorporate everyone. So from the site management to the contractors, plumbers, electricians, and everyone needs to play a part. These kind of pictures where you see ventilation ducting grouped together make it impossible to deal with the air tightness. It's the same here. There was no way to do it properly. So on the airtight test, um, it should be a two-part test. And from a regulations point of view, we actually only need one. Um, but if you want to make any improvements to airtightness, you really need a second test. So I want to take a look at the exterior systems. Um, again, kind of the differences between some of the products can be quite important. Um, but generally, um, if there's a stated U value, and this applies for, or is relevant for both air tightness and wind tightness, all of the U value calculations assume perfect air tightness or, um, and wind tightness. So essentially, there's no influence from the outside on the insulation. So um, kind of how they're installed affects the overall performance of the building. On the market, you'll see two types of products available. There's a microporous and a monolithic. Both are compliant, but there are significant differences between the longevity and how those products work. Microporous is about a 20 year old technology. Um, basically, the membrane looks the same, is, has an unwoven on top and bottom, but typically these products don't have a lot of use fee stability. And the central layer is created by using a, a kind of a calcium carbonate, which is then stretched to provide physical holes in the membrane. These physical holes allow the vapor to pass through. Those products are subject to delamination. Um, and the thing to look out for in building control with microporous products is how long are they exposed? Um, many of them have a cover immediately or as soon as possible label. That means it isn't suitable really for any long-term exposure. So you often see those types of products um, left open for longer periods, in particular at the eaves. The monolithic products um, use a solid or a full breathable polymer layer in the middle. So there's no actual holes through the membrane. Um, these types of products tend to last about 15 times longer and can be installed um, left open for longer periods and can definitely deal with uh, being exposed at eaves. 
again on the video, um, there is the same principle applies here in that we have exterior video applications. Um, again, I won't kind of go into huge detail on that, but just to say that um, again on the YouTube channel. So I'm assuming the sound isn't working here again, but you will see kind of good application details, how much the membranes should be overlapped, how they should be cut, and how they should be applied. We know that it doesn't cover every detail, um, but it you know should be a good improvement for people on site. So on the monolithic technology, um, there is a next generation type of product out there and Exaper Mono Duro is a great example of that. These are a TPU coated product. They have a class B1 fire behavior. Um, generally they're a longer life product, um, but sometimes that fire rating is necessary. Again, from building control point of view, we should be looking at an overall system test um, or buildings above four stories. You do need a B1 product at least. Um, it can be A2, A1 either. So looking at the systems or the connections for those, um, a lot kind of hangs on the air tightness tapes and the wind tightness tape. So what is their quality like? Um, the Partel system uses a solvent free um, age resistant adhesive. So we don't ever expect the tape to fail. Uh, we expect something else to change. You know, so we, we um, would expect the building to be refurbished for other reasons before the tapes will um, create any problems. The, there is quite a deep range of products available and all of that is targeted towards getting better installs. So that could be from the grommets we looked at around the pipes to primers needed in difficult conditions, flexible tapes, sealants, um, they all have a purpose. In terms of the tapes themselves, um, the strength or the final strength of the tapes, or our products at least, is achieved after 24 hours. Part of the reason for that is that we're targeted towards long-term strength. So we're not as focused on the immediate tack and we use an adhesive that is pressure activated. So after we apply the tape, we need to put pressure on the tape and, and good practice on sites is to apply the tapes and to come back at the end of the day and revisit all of the connections. All surfaces should be clean and dry before applying tapes and we should use a primer on porous surfaces. Um, the clean and dry thing applies to Partel tapes as it does to anyone's tape because the tapes will stick just as well to dust or dirt as they will to the membrane. So quality of application is really important. I mentioned earlier about the tested solutions. So we do a significant amount of internal testing. We test the products to the only standard that there is. That's the DIN standard, which probably will become CE standard for tapes. Um, we externally test it at the Passive House Institute. And that's kind of all we can do right now in terms of air tightness testing. You can see here some of the or kind of what a what a peel test looks like on the Conexo tape. This shows the tape after 24 hours, and here we would expect failure on the tape before the adhesive. Um, our adhesives are designed to allow some movement, as are the tapes. So overall, double back on the system test, um, a really integral and important part. This is the actual test um, being carried out at the Passive House Institute. Uh, you can see it tested in a timber scenario um, with concrete and also membrane to membrane. I'm gonna talk a little about thermal bridging now. Um, so overall, Again, it's a quote from Joseph Little, um, U value alone is a blunt instrument for gauging the thermal performance of a building. So something that maybe for me is the next step, we have a lot of people dealing with insulation correctly, air tightness is improving, 
but thermal bridging is the area where we kind of have the next um, step towards uh, certification quality um, and ultimately building performance improvements. So there is a system where people can use ACDs and they use it in every BER. So almost everyone at the moment is using this um, 0.08 um, figure for thermal bridging. That is only usable if all ACDs are used. So is there an accepted construction detail for that junction? Um, there's a lot of standard junctions available or people can have them tested themselves by an NSAI registered assessor. Um, I suspect that that isn't the case, that most people don't build to this figure and they don't use ACDs, but it's definitely a question that can be asked, you know, is that junction an ACD? And if so, can you show me the junction? This is an example of a parapet with and without, um, I suppose, a thermal break. And what it actually shows is a failure. Um, so without the thermal break, we have an FSRI value um, of 0.906. So not an easy thing to spot on a construction site, but um, it's non-compliant and it will give mold issues later. This is the same parapet. Um, where the FSRI value becomes compliant. So here we're looking at a, you know, is the FSRI value greater or equal to 0.75? So we're always, so, sorry, this is the one with it included, the FSRI value is 0.906. You can see the temperature difference as well. It's 17.19 degrees uh, where there's a thermal bridge used and down as low as 13 degrees where there isn't one used. So really significant, but um, I suppose, you know, something that's out there and all around, all around us. This is a totally typical way of um, finishing a, a roof. And this is actually a non-compliance detail, same kind of issue. Temperature is about 13 degrees at the coldest part. So I think it's worthwhile starting to ask those questions. There is assessors out there who can, um, you know, um, carry out these tests, but if you're certainly entitled to ask for that um, ACD detail, you know, where's the approval for that. Um, the options that we provide are more in the line of structural thermal bridging. So that is um, completely recycled, high quality um, PET based um, thermal bridging details. So these products typically sit underneath windows or doors um, or indeed underneath block work. Um, this example here, Alma T is a compliant with part A, L and M, but really it's a, a completely integrated um, drained um, structural solution that also facilitates part M access. There's a couple of different products from us. Uh, Compact Foam is another. Lots of different applications with that to help with thermal bridging. So kind of as we get close to finishing up, I'm going to give you an example of some of the projects we have worked on. Um, it, might, it might spark some questions or comments. This is a just completed hospital extension in Limerick. Um, here they needed to use a fire rated solution and chose Exapur Mono uh, 200 for that. Um, this is a residential project in Dublin where um, they actually had real complications with the flat roof. Um, you can see here they've used Vara Plus in the penthouse apartments and what actually happened here was they had some insulation on the outside, decided they needed to improve the, uh, the U values and that meant some insulation had to come inside. So. Um, we needed first to do some condensation risk assessments and then provide them with a robust detail for how they could suspend the ceiling without damaging the airtightness layer. This is a typical one-off uh, development where people are using the Conexo tape to seal um, the wind type membranes. Um, and again, a good quality example of um, a domestic project where people have um, you know, achieve good results, but you can see small things where they've patched membranes and that's through the use of a lower door test where you're finding these little issues and improvements that need to be made. This is a certified passive house and you can see complete continuity from outside to inside and windows. So really kind of set up for a good quality result from an early stage. So overall, kind of what we try to do is um, provide system and product warranties. We carry um, design indemnity to do a lot of external 
and internal testing. We're available for technical advice to carry out the WUFI condensation risk assessments, new value measurements, on-site training, um, and, C and CPDs for architects. So I think, um, Aina, that is pretty much it if you want to see how we are on time for a Q&A. Okay, thanks, Hugh. Uh, I think, yeah, we have one or two questions. So what I'll do is um, I'll pose a question there from an attendee, uh, Aina Boland. Question on installation humidity for tapes and paints installation. Okay. Any advice? Okay. Um, that kind of varies by product. Um, our tapes and adhesives um, resist humidity very well so essentially the tape or the adhesive can get wet and it won't be affect its performance or it but um maybe the question could be more about um i know when people apply airtight membranes generally the house or the dwelling has a lot of moisture um, it is important to ventilate the house at that period. So um, if you don't do that, the house will be now able to retain some heat and will kind of start to sweat and it can affect other things in the building. Um, for paints installation, I'm not sure exactly um, what's what's intended by that, um, but, but by that part from Aina Boland, I think. Okay, uh, thank you, Hugh. And uh, there was a question that you've already answered, but just for the benefit of the um, attendees again, is there an EN test for air and wind tightness? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so that one is, I suppose the membranes themselves have a CE standard. So it means that the DOP or the Declaration of Performance is enough for the membranes for internal and external, so your air tightness and your roof membranes. Um, what that lacks is the how things are joined together. And that's kind of like you say, what I focused on in the presentation. So um, something like the Passive House Institute is a good way to validate the, the overall um, performance of the system you've chosen. Um, and there is a DIN standard, a German standard, which we test too. Um, so to look for that, but I would say most good quality suppliers are at that kind of level or at that standard. Okay, thank you, Hugh. There's another question here. Where can the most recent ACDs be found? Yeah, they're um, something we can download from the Department of Environment. So they're actually all there and there's a huge amount of information in that. Um, so yeah, that's it. But um, generally your contractor should be providing you with um, a verification of the ACDs used in a building. Um, it's not really carried out right now, but I think it's, a, you know, something that I'd love to see being asked and um, it'll spark more compliance and better quality. Okay, and um, there's an another question here um, regarding uh, a recommended installer in the greater Manchester area. We won't be answering that because obviously we neither, uh, we, we're not in a position to recommend anyone one way or the other and um, so just Aina has just asked for a uh, clarification on the last question gotcha um, yeah it makes sense as soon as I see it yeah so um okay yeah, max ambient I'll let you answer that, yeah yeah so perfect I mean the products um what it actually means for the spray on membranes is their drying time is affected so if it's summertime with better humidity and temperatures it'll dry much quicker um, in winter, all we need to actually watch out for is frost. Uh, the products are water-based, so they have about 70% solid content. And what's actually happening is the product dries to leave the solid. Um, so if you've got frost, that's at risk at that point. But otherwise, you can be fairly free on that. OK, um, that, we have another question, Hugh. Is it harder to achieve lower air tightness levels in a traditional 
block cavity walls compared to timber yeah icf um basically yes pork is the answer to that um it's not to say it's not achievable and people have gotten some amazing results with uh, traditional cavity walls so what it really means is that um there's a much higher level of detailing required so if you want to achieve good quality air tightness on a traditional masonry construction you need a plan and you need time to implement it so your comment about icf or timber frame or something like that those guys can have a maybe a more of a systems based approach um, so again traditional cavity block will have higher costs if you want to achieve good quality air tightness it just needs more time okay uh that's it i think in terms of questions we'll just give it one more minute then if you stop your screen share um yeah please you and i'll just bring up my final Okay, so just bearing in mind, there's no questions. Um, I'm going to carry on. We have a number of events outlined. Live events will be circulated with the Eventbrite and recordings will be on our MBCO YouTube channel, MBCO DCC. And um, the recent workshop on heat pumps is a recorded event and we'll be circulating that uh, shortly. So I'd like to thank the team here at MBCO and in particular Hugh from Partel for organizing this webinar and a very informative presentation. And just before we complete, there might be one more question. No, it's just a comment. So. Thanks all to everyone for attending and goodbye. Thank you. Cheers.